Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACS Webinars, connecting you with the best and brightest minds in chemistry, live from Washington, D.C. I'm Michael David, and I am pleased to be your host for today's broadcast, which is being co-produced with ACS External Affairs and Communications and ACS Publications. The Center for Disease Control has advised wearing face masks to fight the spread of the novel coronavirus, but what type of mask work best? And is it possible to sanitize PPE and other equipment needed to keep our healthcare workers safe? Today, we are joined by Supertik Guha of the University of Chicago and Argonne National Laboratory, and Yi Tre of Stanford University, who are going to share research regarding efficient materials and proper disinfection methods. Our moderator for today is Laura Cassidy, who is a senior science writer with the American Chemical Society, she earned a PhD in biochemistry from the Mayo Clinic and did postdoctoral work at the University of California, San Francisco before transitioning to science writing. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura to get today's presentation started. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction and thanks so much to all of you for joining us. Face masks are a hot topic right now as we try to slow the spread of COVID-19. Because surgical and N95 masks are in short supply and should be reserved for healthcare workers, Many people are making their own homemade cloth masks. Our first speaker will discuss his research on the best materials for cloth masks. Dr. Supertik Guha is professor at the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago and a scientist in physical sciences and engineering at Argonne National Laboratory. Until 2015, he was at IBM Research where he served as director of physical sciences. A material scientist, Dr. Guha develops new devices and systems for information processing technologies. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the Materials Research Society and the American Physical Society. The second speaker of this webinar will be discussing his research on the best way for hospitals to disinfect N95 masks, which are the special masks used by healthcare workers that filter out 95% of airborne particles. As I'm sure we're all aware, there's currently a shortage of N95 masks. And because of this, many healthcare workers have had to wear the same mask repeatedly throughout the day, or even over multiple days. Dr. Yi Chui is a professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering at Stanford University. He received his PhD in 2002 from Harvard. In 2014, Dr. Chui was ranked number one in material science on Thomson Reuters list of the world's most influential scientific minds. He is a fellow of the Materials Research Society, the Electrochemical Society, and the Royal Society of Chemistry, and he's an associate editor of the ACS journal, Nano Letters. Dr. Tway has founded three companies to commercialize technologies from his group. And now I'll turn it over to you, Supertik. Yeah, thank you, Laura, for the introduction. And I would also like to thank the American Chemical Society for the invitation to give this webinar. So, I will talk to you about some results that we have recently obtained on the filtration efficiencies of cloth mask. This work was done by my colleagues and myself from the University of Chicago and Argonne National Labs, uh, and the authors are listed on the slide that you see in front of them, of you. So face mask protective wear has come a long way since the 17th and 18th centuries. During those times, at the times of the plagues and the pandemics, doctors used to wear the sort of bird's beak-like mask that you can see in the image on your left. They'd wear the gums, they'd, they'd have glasses in the eye socket positions, and the beaks would be filled with herbs and lavender and flowers to ward off what they used to call the miasma, which they felt was what transmitted the disease. And this was, of course, before germ theory was uh, was recognized. And today, as all of you know by now, that there are different types of disposable masks, the N95s that Laura referred to, the surgical masks, the one-time usable masks. And these all have to uh, meet certain specifications and regulations from different countries. But the, in a situation where that we are faced in today, these masks are often not available and certain masks like Laura mentioned, the N95s and the surgical masks have to be reserved for the use of critical users like hospital workers and so on. 
It's interesting to note that in March of 2019, there was a National Academy report that was published on respirators, where they noted that it would be very important to stockpile reusable respirators, and they meant of the types that have elastomers, that have disposable cartridges, and so on. And they made the point that these should be stockpiled for emergencies such as pandemics. And this document was prescient in many ways. But where does it leave the public in the face of such a pandemic? So starting around March, we started noticing that news reports that the Center for Disease Control was going to be recommending that the public use face masks and governors from some states have already recommended that. At that time, we also realized that there was very little solid experimental data on the filtration efficiencies of various household fabrics that were being used for face masks and masks and anticipating that this is something that is an industry that would grow, the public would need them. We decided that we would like to make some measurements of these filtration efficiencies using laboratory grade instruments, which we had at Argon. So this is, this is what motivated the study. We built an experimental setup and we got express permission at Argon within 24 hours to use the lab because the labs were shut down and we began the experiments. So just a little bit of background. What one is interested in is in filtering out what are called aerosol particles. And these are particles that have dimensions that go as low as about 10 nanometers uh, to about 10 microns. And these particles are called aerosols essentially because they hang in the air. Okay. Larger particles drop off and fall due to gravity. But these are particles that are given off when somebody is breathing, uh, exhaling, speaking, uh, coughing, sneezing, and so on and so forth. And it is these aerosol particles that people believe are the, uh, a key source for the transmission of viral infections. And this is why things like the six foot rule and all have come about to prevent somebody from inhaling, you know, high enough viral load so as to catch an infection. So if you look at the size of particles and how they behave with a filtering media, this subject has been very well studied. And the very small particle, but let me start from the other end, the very large particles, they essentially have a lot of momentum and kinetic energy. They come in, they come, they hit the mask surface or the fabric surface, and they are stopped due to the process of impaction. Particles that are of the order of a few hundred nanometers to about 10 microns in size, so now we're in the aerosol range of particles. These, these guys have a lot of momentum, but then they are also disturbed by the aerodynamic drag force that brings them around the fiber cross sections. And then they get stuck in the gaps between the fibers, and this is the process of interception. And then when you go to extremely small particles, that's those that are less than about 100 nanometers or so, uh, then they get stuck by electrostatic attraction. Essentially, there are uh, asymmetries in charge asymmetries in the molecules of the within the droplets and the molecules of the fiber to uh, make this explanation very simple. And then there is an electrostatic dipole-dipole interaction that holds these particles and traps them. So those are the three mechanisms. The difficult zone to filter is typically around 300 nanometers. At that point, the particles are a little too small for interception and a little too heavy for electrostatic trapping. Okay. And you'll see that in the data that we show. So what we did is we took a whole bunch of different fabrics that and weaves that are available commercially, and we decided to test them. And here is a table uh, of that list. I will talk about some of the ones that we felt worked quite well a little later. This is the experimental setup. It consists of two plexiglass chambers 
connected by a PVC tube. One chamber, the one you see on your right, is the upstream chamber. This is where we generate an aerosol. The aerosol here is basically droplets of salt water. It's a standard commercial sodium chloride particle generator. This is what is used in tests such as those that are used to measure respirator fit and efficiencies. And then there is a pump on the downstream side that, that sucks the air through the test specimen, which in this case is a piece of fabric that is tied with the hose clamp around the PVC tube. So it's a very simple arrangement. And what we do is we measure the number of particles as a function of particle size upstream and then downstream. And then we can effectively figure out the efficiency of the filtration as a function of particle size. And this was important because we noticed that there weren't a lot of studies that showed the efficiencies as a function of particle size. It's not known quite clearly what's the size regime of droplets that are particularly critical for the transmission of the, uh, the SARS-2 virus for, for, for COVID-19. It's, it's dimensions, the dimensions of the virus themselves itself is between about 60 nanometers to about 140 nanometers. So that gives you an idea of the typical droplet sizes that, that might contain enough viral loads. But this is the experimental setup. We built it within a day or so. It's very simple. And this was refreshing to me because in my day job, I work on ultra high vacuum systems. And for us to build the chamber, it can take months and a big part of the year. But we were ready and going within a couple of days with these experiments. So this shows the typical data that we receive. There's two pieces of equipment that we use in order to measure the particle size and distribution. Both are, are, are built by this company called TSI that specializes in this field. The larger particles, more than about 300 nanometers, we use, it uses a typical optical scattering method to count them. The smaller particles are used, are, are separated out in an, using an electrostatic deflection process. That tool is a relatively new one called a nanoscan. But essentially we do six sets of measurements upstream and downstream, actually seven sets. And then we throw away one using a statistical test. And there is fluctuation in these numbers because particularly for the nano scan, the measurement of the extremely small particles, the total particle size is small. There are often outguessing events, et cetera, and that gives some noise into the system. But from the data like this, we can then translate it into filtration efficiency as a function of particle size. And I've shown you examples of two well-known masks here, the N95 and the surgical masks. And not surprisingly, they perform very well above 0.3 microns, which is 300 nanometers, which is where they are specced to perform very well. Now we tested different fabrics and instead of going through all the results, I'd like to give you a few highlights that, that make the points that we would like to make. Now the first is cotton. It's, it's important to have cotton that have tighter weaves that is higher pick and end densities, linear densities, and you typically measure it commercially in stores as thread count. So you want to use a cotton weave that has a higher thread count than a lower thread count. And you can see that clearly on the figure on the top where we've compared a 600 and an 80 thread count cotton. We've used a standard cotton quilt that has a thin batting inside it. It's an old quilt. And that's the red curve that performed very well. We also tried materials that we, we expected to have electrostatic filtration capabilities and, and they were quite good. We tried silk, we tried a chiffon weave of uh, a polyester spandex fabric. We tried flannels. What I'd like to point out is silk. Um, silk is very breathable, it's light. And when we used four layers of the silk, as one would, for instance, if one just wrapped a scarf around the nose, the efficiency goes up significantly. Compared to single layer of silk, that's the red curve, 
or with the green curve, there's the four layer of soil. So after all of these studies, what we ended up finding worked best were hybrid combinations where we use cotton to provide mechanical filtration, and then we use something like a silk or a chiffon weave to provide a electrostatic filtration. So these are some of the best results we obtained. So for instance, if we take a 600 thread count cotton with two layers of silk as the green curve, you see the filtering properties are well above 90% across the range. The same is the case for cotton with two layers of chiffon. And we've recently also been finding that polypropylene, woven polypropylene of the right weight and weave can also possibly be used to substitute silk. So this is something that we've just very recently been learning and are studying that in a bit more detail. We looked at the, uh, the effects of leakage. Uh, now, given the situation that labs are closed, that there is a pandemic going on, obviously we could not do human testing. So the way we simulated this is that on the PVC tube where we did these filtration studies, we drilled little holes on the rim of the tube to simulate leaks. Now, this is you know not an ideal situation that may be representative of real life because of aerodynamic flow issues. But what we learned was that even small amounts of leaks, let's say one to 2% of the total effective filtration area, drop the filtration efficiencies by a factor of two or more. And if you talk to respiratory test specialists, they will tell you that this is not surprising, that the fit is critically important. And, you know, if you're wearing an N95, for instance, even if you have a five o'clock shade, you know, a day's growth of beard, that may be enough to, to really drop the filtration efficiency of your mask. So the point we wanted to make here to cloth mask users and designers was that the fit was just as important as the fabric. Based on all of this, we have now been creating one of my colleagues, Mike Schmoltz, who's an expert in respiratory testing from Argonne has been creating a spec document that we've been giving to people involved in procurement at within Argonne and within the University of Chicago. And organizations today are rushing to get cloth masks for their employee, employees in anticipation uh, of things opening up. To, and, and the goal here with this spec document is to put some orderliness. Today, if you look at the cloth mask sales business, vendors have very poor benchmarking of the products. There is almost no or little mention of the weave of the cotton, of the types of fabrics that are used. And there needs to be some rigor over there. Uh, and this is how essentially specification documents come up. People put them out, then there's a committee, and then they agree upon something. But this is a very rough draft that we've been showing around. And essentially what we're saying, the following conclusions, that use tighter weaves better than open weaves. Don't put too many layers because then you completely filter out the passage of air and more air will simply go in through the gaps look for fabrics with large surface areas, try to combine electrostatic and mechanical filtration. And these fabrics, et cetera, need to be tested out more rigorously for humidity and washability. There's also a lot of masks out there these days or an increasing number of masks, I should say, that talk about antibacterial properties with various types of impregnated nanostructures. Copper and silver is one example. I'm not quite sure they work. They need to be tested out before, before validity, before they should be accepted by the public. Out of all this, in conclusion of my talk, I do believe that there's a huge future opportunity here in using washable, reusable masks that can replace one-time use masks in many, many circumstances, non-critical circumstances in hospitals or you know, healthcare organizations, for instance, is just one example. And these could be clock masks that have local sourcing instead of relying on global sourcing supply chains, which in some ways has led to the shortage of a lot of these masks. So there is room here for this type of technology to emerge out of all of this. 
Uh, and that uh, is the end of my presentation. What I'd like to do is turn it over now to my colleague Yi from Stanford. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dick, for the very nice talk. Very exciting result. Super Tick is just introduced to you about how to use commonly available fabric right, to make masks. I want to share with you somewhat related works we have been conducting in the past roughly three months or also. We know in during COVID-19, this significant you know, shortage of N95 masks. And then later as well as how do we have the regular masks for household to use for individual, not in the medical environment. So it's important to figure out how do we disinfect the mask particularly N95, and can we use it multiple times because of big shortage? And what are the materials for, for the home use from the basic fabric materials? Simple thing just share with you. And also understanding the filtration mechanism more. So this topic right here cover you know, some of our past three months data. This is the work in collaboration as this Stanford team right here. Steve Chu is my close collaborators on this topic, along with a few other colleagues. And also Slack National Lab doing X-ray imaging. A 4CL team, 4CL is the startup company I co-founded, and they have been doing quite a bit of work as well. The main technology right there is air filtration. I also work with this called demand team and to help the World Health Organization to prepare for the developing countries, the big shortage of mass in Africa and South America, and working with the CDC scientists as well. So a separate thing just show you the size of the virus. This size really ma matters, right? The COVID-19 we are talking about, this uh, virus is about 150 nanometers. It could be a little bit smaller. There's a little bit variation of that. Overall, the virus giving you really require you to consider the size range down to you know about 100 nanometer or so. By the same time, you need to keep in mind that this virus could be at a droplet, right? The, the size could be large. So the reason you want to wear a mask is actually twofold. When two people communicate speaking, sneezing, coughing, this the big drop will coming down. Larger than 10 micron will usually drop, settle down very fast. And then less than five micron particularly could go deeper into a person's lung and get people infected. So that's through the droplet mechanism. But also you need to remember this droplet can evaporate, right? The water can evaporate, it can get down to much smaller size once it's go down below about two micron, about one micron also, they're going to flow in the air for a long time and you know, 10, 12 hours or days without coming down to the ground. So for both consideration, preventing droplet when you are closer to each other, as well as those aerosol, and they stay in the air for a long time for both reasons, you should consider wearing masks, particularly in the indoor environments. Wearing masks is a good idea with more people, there's not enough of, uh, air exchange right there. If it's outdoor in a crowded environment, wearing a mask could potentially protect you. If you go deeper into the mask, right, mask consists of these materials. This is a micron-sized fiber. And this micron-sized fiber have a typically one to 10 micron for the most effective pass, pass, part of the mask. They have a three-dimensional structure, highly porous, 90% porosity easily. And But with this porosity right there, you are going to have low air pressure drop. That means breathability is good, mm -hmm. but the filtration efficiency is not sufficient. So you will need to have electrostatic charge increase the particle filtration efficiency for the N95 level of mass you're talking about. And the, the reason is simple. In a fiber configuration, the electrical field E scale with lambda, that's charge density over R. This R parameters right is radius. The smaller the radius, the larger the electrical field. So typically, male blowing is the process to produce fibers, typically polypropylene fibers, one to 10 micron in diameters. 
And this oblong fiber, they are not strong enough. They are often protected by spawn bound, much bigger fibers. But male oblong is the main one giving you high filtration efficiency and, and the N95 mask. So people already you know, went through what type of mask, why there, what type of filtration efficiency, I will not need to repeat it. Now let's go in into the N95 mask. We recently published a paper and ACS Nano to uh, highlight how do we do disinfection. What you really want to have is without reducing the filtration efficiency after disinfection, using those methods, you know, from the, the uh, viral scientists, when they study those methods, that can be effective to disinfect. Now, if we open up this mask, you see A right here with three layers. In the middle, go look at B, this is the SEM. You can see this male blown layer and zoom in, that's C. Mm. That has the fiber from about one micron to about 10 micron. And on the top and bottom, if you look, look at B, those are the spawn bound layers, sandwich this male blown to protect it. With static charge in there, it can increase efficiency a lot. So in order to measure the filtration efficiency, after different uh, type of disinfection method, we actually use these uh, standard equipment. I think this is very important right here. I want to highlight TSI-8130. This is instrument. When a NIOSH and the CDC, they do the certification of N95 masks. This is the standard instrument they use. The, for N level, non-oil particle, sodium chloride is used, it's actually neutral particle. The mean mass diameter is uh, 0 0.26 micron. It's actually size distribution is very narrow. There's many very small particles actually below uh, this 0.26 micron, but the mean mass diameter is 0.26. And the fabric level, the flowing the um, flow rate the air, that's two liter per minute for a hundred centimeter square size sample. This is mimicking the regular breathing condition of a human. And the mass level, the standard test under NIOSH will use 85 liter per minute. This is under the condition is much higher than your breathing requires to simulate the condition. And uh, to make sure even you are doing, you know, very intense uh, breathing, uh, you can still filter out these particles. So this instrument showing right here is we put a fabric right there and, and then close it and then measure the air pressure drop, measure the filtration efficiency at the same time. So we started to identify what are the methods that could be effective, right, for, you know, disinfection that at the same time can keep the filtration efficiency. Under the consideration, we are going to develop this for hospitals as well as for individual household, they should be easily implement those. And so we look at, for example, the first one, the hot air and the R1, this is dry air, 70 degrees Celsius, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. The reason we picked this condition is in the past, in the SARS-1 time, and the coronavirus was shown about 60, 65 degrees Celsius solution, about 30 minutes can disinfect the uh, virus completely. That's the initial base we pick this condition. We consider UV and we consider the uh, alcohol solution, chlorine bleach and hot steam from boiling water. If you look at this, right, filtration efficiency of this initial and 95 level of fabric, 100 centimeter square, is 96% efficiency. Air pressure drop is A. Now after the treatment of this N95, level fabric. You see that right away, the red color highlight, alcohol is not a good idea. Filtration efficiency drop down to 56%. Air pressure drop 7 part and 8 part, they are more or less the same. This is within arrow bar. So what it means is this fabric keeps its a physical structure. However, the static charge is reduced significantly if you use alcohol to treat it. A chlorine base is similar, efficiency is dropped a lot. So that's why when we first, we come up with study about two months ago, the Stanford Hospital published our results, you know, circulated in the Medicare community and advising all the doctors, don't use alcohol or chlorine-based bleach to treat your mask. Let's look at the hot steam right here. The hot steam, 
efficiency reduced slightly, a little bit, not that much. One time sounds like okay. And UV sounds okay, 70 degree hot air sounds okay. okay. So after this, we concentrate on a few methods that looks promising to do detailed study. And first is to look at the hot steam. The, look at the left hand side, the hot steam after three cycles, filtration efficiency still maintain about 95%. But fifth cycle of treatment, it dropped to 85, 10 cycles is just low, be, be about 80% now. So we don't recommend the hot steam to treat your mass more than three cycles. However, 75 degrees Celsius, now you notice I raise the temperature to 75. Over 10 cycles, no problem. The UVG, right, the UV treatment, uh, uh, UVC, the wavelength, also okay. Air pressure drop maintained more or less within the arrow bar, showing this doesn't physically damage the structure, but the steam could remove the static charge. So we go further, we think the heat method is highly promising because if you have an oven, right, heating is highly accessible in hospital environment as well as an individual household. We start to screen the heating condition. You can see on the left hand side, 75 degrees Celsius, right? 85, 100, 125. Let, you notice that 125, so the efficiency dropped down to close to 90%, 125 degrees Celsius dry heat, right? Less than 30% humidity. But up to 100 degrees Celsius, the N95 fabric is more or less maintained under the dry heat condition. So we think this is very exciting. You know, the detail is highlighted in the bottom left, right here, how many minutes we treated. And the air pressure drop is more or less within the noise, right? You know, air robot, it, it really doesn't damage the physical structure. 125 degrees Celsius efficiency drop. Maybe now it's closer to the melting point of polypropylene, which is about 140 to 270 degrees Celsius. So material start to relax its structure a little bit, you know, to dissipate its static charge. That's, that's why efficiency is dropping for 125 degrees Celsius. Then we also want to understand the humidity. So for example, and this is the data, this is the 85 degrees Celsius per cycle, 20 minutes, right? A and B is different humidity, you know, 30%, 70%, and 100% humidity. After 20 cycles of treatment, this efficiency virtually no change. That's very exciting. So for one of the humidity, 30%, we even test out, you look at C and D. 50 cycle, you know, a little bit of dropping, but not a whole lot. So, so this heating condition treatment, we think is very, very promising. And then that's the fabric. Now this slide, I want to show the real mask. We actually were able to collect a number of brands in, in the world, from the world. The left hand side is the 3M filtration efficiency. 3M and then 4C Air, that's my startup company, and another brand, OP and ES. So for each brand, we're testing initial efficiency and also 85 degrees Celsius, different humidity, 30% humidity, 10 cycle, 20 cycle, and 100% humidity, 10 cycle, and 20 cycle. You look at all this mass level of testing, they're all about, about 99%, a really good mass right there. So what's the big difference? I think Silverton indeed also emphasized in his talk is actually air pressure drop. That indicates the breathability, the lower the air pressure drop, that's better. So 3M is about close to 80 par. The 4C air incorporating nanotechnology in there, we, uh, we call it Manhattan Stanford, is about close to 50, 60 par. OP and ES, they're higher. So the difference is indeed in the air pressure drop right there. So now I want to come, come back to this question. And with all this disinfection method right there, like heating, so promising, does it really do the job to kill the virus? Now let me share with your data in the literature. This is on the top is in solution, 70 degrees Celsius in solution, five minutes complete disinfection. Let me emphasize, this is in solution, and our case is in heating environment. It's dry heat or with different humidity. So there's another report at the bottom right here, 70 degrees Celsius, dry heat, 60 minutes, complete disinfection as shown as the data right here. We also collaborated with uh, Scott Beaver and Texas. 
and asked his team to test out our dry heat condition right there. So not publishing data, but I can orally share with everybody, right? And about uh, 85 degrees Celsius, about 20 minutes, and uh, disinfect all the virus, very high concentration of uh, COVID-19, the uh, SARS-2 virus. And, but that's without BSA. If I have a BSA protein, it needs to have higher temperature on the dry heat, but 95 degrees Celsius would disinfect uh, for about 15 minutes, disinfect all the uh, SARS-2. So very exciting, so 95. So we say in mind, and after Scott showed us this data, we say we need to study 95 carefully. I want to share with you 95 degrees Celsius. This fabric actually can maintain its filtration efficiency in the dry heat, less than 30% humidity. If it's 100% humidity, 95 degrees Celsius, efficiency after 10 cycles drops slightly, but still above about 92, 93%. Still very exciting to, to treat this mask. And the pressure drop is more or less the same, so the physical structure doesn't get damaged. So in about a week or two, we should be able to conclude, recommend to the, the whole world, to the nation, about what the, what's the condition we can, you know, completely treat this mass, maintain filtration efficiency, it disinfect uh, all the viruses. So in summary, the heating method looks very promising. A dry heat below 100 degrees Celsius is safe for N95 male blown fabric. So, but be cautious. What, what you need to be careful is, of course, the strap, right? You know, the elasticity, you need to test that out. We test some temperature already. They look good. The final conclusion will be coming in about a few weeks. And humid heat can do below 95 degrees Celsius, I say roughly. But if it's 100 degrees Celsius steam, looks like after three cycles, it can damage your filtration efficiency. I also want to make some comment about UV. UV in principle is a good method, but you need to be careful because of the fabric three-dimensional structure. The penetration depth of UV is a concern, the shadow effect, and also what's the dose it takes to disinfect. It's much harder for laymen to judge. So for, for the industry application, if you have good engineering control, UV could be a good method, so but needs to be careful. UV we know after 20 cycle, after 10, go to 20 cycle, if you start to drop quite a bit. So what about other methods like ethylene oxide, hydrogen peroxide, chlorine oxide, ozone? These are all potentially very exciting methods. And, and with good engineering control, I think these are the great methods to use. But because of these, all these chemicals, they have toxicity right there. You want to make sure after the treatment, you know, all this residue is gone. So for individual person to do it, I will bet there will be a lot of variability right there. So people need to be careful uh, about this. Otherwise, you put in this mask with this residue on the mask, you keep wearing that for multiple hours, that can have, you know, unhappy consequence right there. So with the mass, you know, research going on, uh, we, I see it's very important right there. Uh, uh, we need to understand sodium chloride, this particle filtration, you know, how does it go into the mass? This X-ray CT, this is unpublished data I want to share with everybody. This is a video. The, the blue dots are the sodium chloride particle. And in those fiber shape, you see the N95 level mass. The filtration is from top to bottom. Right there, you can see the particle concentrate on the top and slowly going in and in the bottom you see a little bit. We're in the process of studying this to really try to provide information to understand the air filtration of this particle. Mm. In the same time, like the synthetic, we are also looking into the household materials using the standard testing of different type of fabric and even paper. We actually have some exciting discovery right there. I want to highlight the Q is the quality factor, the right-hand side column. That's a nice way to judge all type of fabric. Certainly, N95 level has the highest level of Q. That's the efficiency on the top, you know, divided by the air pressure job, right? 160 type of level. We also find out cotton is reasonable. And even the, the tissue paper, for facial tissue paper, having the five quality factor. It looks exciting as well. So I, I won't go into detail of that. You know, uh, I hope this can be shared with the community very soon. 
and, and it turned out to be this filtration efficiency highly correlated with the microstructure of this type of fabric as well as whether you have static charge in there or not. So more to come. I also want to highlight in the future. So for filtration technology, what's really needed? I think a very exciting direction to go is using polymer nanofiber. Five years ago, my group published a paper in Nature Communication to highlight the polymer nanofiber having high filtration efficiency for the PM2.5 particles. We actually take this technology using the 4C air product and see amazing effect. It's a high filtration efficiency and low air pressure job. To share with you with one video is in the dark field optical microscope image, this nanofiber can capture these very small particles in real time and be quite exciting to see. So let me just conclude by just by thanking operators from uh, many places. This is ongoing project and I hope to be able to share with this, uh, every one of you down the road with even more data. Thank you very much for your attention. I think I'm going to turn over this to Laura. She will be a moderate the question session. Thank you. Thank you, Yi and Supertick, for two very interesting presentations. We've had a lot of questions come in, and we'll try to get through as many of these as possible. I'll start out with one for Supertick. What order of layers would you recommend for the fabrics in a homemade mask? For example, should the silk or chiffon layer be on the inside or the outside of the mask? So that's a good question, and this is these are the kinds of things that we are beginning to look at. So I don't know the answer for sure. My guess is that if you know, given that these are acting as electrostatic filters, they can be negatively impacted by humidity, and in that case, I would suggest keeping the chiffon or the silk on the outside instead of towards the nose. On the other hand, what we are also seeing is that if there is humidity, the fibers swell up somewhat, and in some cases, actually, the efficiency can increase. So it's not clear uh, whether that makes a difference at all, and if it does, to what extent in the net, but this is something that, that we, are, we need to look at more carefully, and we are. Okay, very good. Yi, the next question is for you. Would these disinfection methods you examined work for surgical masks as well as for N95 masks? So, well, for surgical masks, I, I, I found with, with recent study, where right, some of the surgical masks inside right there, that the melblong polypropylene layer has static charge. Some of them actually don't. So I, I, I would say because it's same polypropylene materials, so the disinfection method we have right there will be applied to the surgical mask as well. For the surgical mask without the static charge right there, and uh, so then this treatment method, you know, if you don't damage its physical structure, so it wouldn't affect the surgical mask, they don't have static charge. But let me also mention the surgical mask without static charge, the filtration efficiency tend to be on the, on the low side, you know, 30% or so. Some surgical mask filtration efficiency can go up to about 60%, 70% range, even 80% with the static charge right there. There's a big difference. Okay. Next question, super tick. Will the combination of cotton with silk or chiffon actually filter filter out viruses as well as these tiny aerosolized droplets you study? Well, what we've studied and what most people study in these types of, you know, experiments is the filtration of droplets. In our case, the droplets were saltwater droplets. It is assumed that in, in an infectious transmission, these droplets will contain viruses. People have looked at, at the how these aerosols behave once you create them, the very small particles the water can start evaporating off and then the the virus or, or other molecules within the water can start agglomerating. And so it's not very clear, right? And, and it's difficult to figure these things out. So I think what I'd say is that at this point, the study we have done has been for droplets and, and, and we haven't, it is very difficult to you know, individually figure out if the virus is transmitting or not. There's a second question that if a virus does make it through, does it float around on the inside or does it stay stuck? 
to the surface of the mosque? And again, those are interesting questions. They, you know, there's been very little studies on that sort of thing, particularly for cloth mosques, which is which is going to be the you know largest mosque usage as far as we can understand going forward. Okay. But Yi, the next question, we've had several questions about using the sun to disinfect N95 masks. Could solar radiation be used just simply by laying the mask out in the sun? And if so, how long would it take? If you want me to predict, I think it will take a long time. And uh, the UV dose required is indeed quite high to do so. Consider you need to penetrate through this mask. So put it onto the sun. I, I don't think it's going to be that effective. All right, uh, super sick. One person says, I've read that masks protect others, but not necessarily the wearer. If the mask stops dro droplets in one direction, why should it not stop in the other direction? Yeah, I've heard that too, and I don't believe it. You know, the mask will provide barrier in both directions. And it all depends a lot on the situation. Uh, if somebody is sneezing very hard, and those droplets can travel at 200 kilometers per, uh, you know, per hour kind of velocities. And then it becomes a very different situation in terms of their filtration. It can, it can penetrate through. So it depends on the situation, but I, I agree with, with the questioner that, that uh, you know, it protects both ways. There is no reason why it will just protect the, you know, the person outside the mask. Okay, interesting. Yi, could any of these masks, could you use a microwave as a way to disinfect masks? This is a great question. When we started this project, we wanted to use microwave as well. Then immediately we recognized one problem. These uh, facial masks uh, for N95, right? I think nearly all of them having this nose piece consists of metal in there. There's a metallic piece in there. So then this can cause problem during microwave. If you put metal into microwave, that's why we didn't, uh, we kind of drop that idea right away. However, I think microwave is still remain as an excellent method to quickly heat up the mass. You know, it's very convenient. It's available everywhere. Perhaps it's just people need to remove that metallic piece uh, down the road when they produce the N95. Okay, very good. Super sick. Many people are creating masks using HEPA filters from vacuum bags or air filters. Do you think this is useful? You know, we discussed that and we stayed away from testing those materials simply because a lot of those, I believe, can contain fibrous materials that may not be quite, quite safe, right? So they may not be cleared for safe respiratory use because there's a lot of such products out there. So while in concept these might work, you know, because of the variability of the materials used in them, we decided to stay away from those materials in our testing. Okay. Yeah, we have a question about your experimental setup. Why did you use E. coli bacteria and not a virus to check the disinfection efficiency? Right at the beginning, because we are not allowed to do <laughs> the SARS-2 virus. This is requires certain biosafety level. And our first initial experiment to see whether this is reasonable to kill E. coli. Then right after that, we say, huh, we, we don't really don't have facility to do virus. So uh, we, we actually stopped doing E. coli. The late experiment, those virus testing, is was done through collaboration. So we basically only internally evaluate the filtration efficiency, pressure drop, that's it. So yeah, I, I agree, you know, the reason to do E. coli is for E. coli, it's not for virus. Okay. What kind of chiffon and silk were used in your experiments? So we used a natural silk, um, and it had a weight of about nine, I guess the pronunciation for this is me. That's the way silk is weighed, M-O-M-M-E. -M -M -E. And so one could just look that up on the web. But that's the weight, so it was a light silk. But the key thing, it was a natural silk. It was not, not an artificial silk. I don't know exactly 
what type of silk it was, but my suspicion is that it was what's called a habotai uh, type of silk. It's been a little difficult to get exact specifications of materials, you know, exact scientific specifications when we've sourced it from standard commercial outlets. And so that's been something that, you know, we're, we're trying to improve as we go forward. But that's what I can tell you about the silk. The chiffon was a polyester, 90% polyester, 10% spandex chiffon weave. So chiffon is not a fabric, it's a weave. It, it, it has these two types of yarns called S and Z twist, which are basically have yarns of different handedness, uh, you know, clockwise and anti-clockwise, and they are a little twisted. So it's called, you know, crepe yarn, I believe. And then if you alternate them, it gives you that, you know, slightly crinkly thing that, that chiffon does. The sheerness uh, of the fabric comes from that. So that's what we tested. It's important to look at what also Yi alluded to and referred to and showed micrographs about. It's important that the weaves be tight. Okay, that I think is the key. Uh, there's also differences between woven and non-woven types of materials. So those are some important things to look at. Okay. Well, the next question is for Yi. What effect does heat have on the fit of N95 masks? Oh, the, this is a great question as well. The, the fit is so important to the you know, face. We have been paying attention to after the treatment, whether you kind of distort your mask, the, change the fitting. So with limited testing, we have been doing 75 degrees Celsius, I think 30 minutes treatment, the fit testing is fine. But with that saying, we have not done extensive fit testing after that. So because of, uh, well, for practical reason, the number of masks available, and the fit testing uh, instrument availability. But I think that, that that's important down the road to, te to test out 95, 85 degrees Celsius after heat treatment. From the visual inspection, they, they look fine, but require more detailed testing. Okay, super sick. How do detergents and soaps affect the cloth mat face mask materials effectiveness? Say if somebody was to wash their mask, would it have different properties afterwards? It's a very good point. This is something that we're looking at as we speak, trying to wash material several times and then retest them. So one of our goals has been to have washable materials. And while our initial studies showed that silk performed very well, one of the concerns with silk is will it last after several cycles through a washing machine? And this is one of the reasons we've been looking at alternative materials that are also readily available. So we're looking for washability and ready availability, you know, in, in mass quantities. And, and so this is where we're looking at a material like polypropylene, you know, Yi spoke about it, showed some beautiful results from it, but that's, that's something that we're looking as a substitute, which, which may be washable as long as it's not washed under very hot conditions. But this is something that we are testing out right now of different types of fabrics, even cotton. We've, we've done a little bit of it and so far it looks like at least cotton, you know, works out okay with, with washing, but we'll, we'll, we'll probably be, you know, releasing those results sometime soon. So, so Laura, can I add in something right mm -hmm. here regarding to this question? Sure. So if washing using soap for N95, I only speak about for N95, it's not recommended for sure because of with soap and water going in, N95 static charge will be gone as well. So not recommended. Okay, very good. And it looks like we are now out of time for questions. So now I'll ask our speakers for any final thoughts. You do you have any final thoughts on on this issue? And if there's one important lesson that our lessons should that our listeners should learn from your presentation today, what would that be? So briefly, I I, I believe indeed wearing masks is important. You don't for general public, you don't necessarily need N95 
if you just do surgical mass level or the household mass, you know, with about 30% filtration efficiency, uh, slightly above that, will be very helpful to prevent the, the spreading of uh, COVID-19. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I, I think this uh, from my a little bit of study and also listening to Supratic's study, the, the homemade mask has, uh, you know, could be quite useful and indeed from filtration efficiency standpoint, looks uh, very, very attractive. And, you know, disinfection, of course, everybody feel free to look at my publication. I think we document that quite a bit. Yeah, I'll stop right here. Okay, very good. Thank you. Supertick, do you have any final thoughts? No, I, you know, I, I would echo that the, you know, cloth masks behave surprisingly well. They're definitely much better than not wearing any masks. It is very important for mask designers to really specify their fabrics. And it is very important for users, I believe, to pay particular attention to the fit of the mask. So you can have the best filtration fabrics in the world, but if the fit isn't good, then you lose most of that benefit. Thank you for watching this presentation. ACS Webinars is provided as a service by the American Chemical Society as your professional source for live weekly discussions and presentations that connect you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders concerning today's relevant issues in the chemical sciences, management, and business.